old Nintendo gamer. And son. And a big topic of the week is our Pod Pals community event where our community chose to play through what remains of Edith Finch together and talk about it together. And as Nick isn't here, we have Nick's thoughts on the game itself. And to introduce you, if you haven't played the game, to what the game is, I can't find any better words on the internet than what Jonas has typed to introduce the game. And he did this when he played it um, a fair few years ago. He came in then later and added his uh, more di uh, uh, an addendum to his thoughts, which was slightly more spoilery as we go through. So yes, if you haven't played What Remains of Edith Finch, you can finish it, Greg, in about two and a half hours. Uh, not probably not even. I'd say two hours is maximum. Go and play it, and then come back and listen to this section. It is uh, for me a delightful little title. That's a spoiler already, and we'll find out what everybody else thought as we go through. So Jonas's review, basically, of what remains of Edith Finch is this. I bought this on a sale a couple of months back. I recall the Easy Allies considering this one of the best games of 2017, as well as a friend of mine praising it, as he doesn't usually play games like this, so I figured it would be a neat, short Halloween game. As it turns out, this wasn't a horror game at all. It was more like a bittersweet tale. It's part of the environmental narrative genre, also known as ENG, or Walking Simulator for short, and can be finished in two to three hours. You play as Edith Finch, a young woman, visiting her abandoned family house and learning about her family history through the lens of magical realism, not unlike the book A Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Without spoiling too much, the game's presentation gets creative and keeps you engaged all the way through. By the end, you'll be waving theories about the more ambiguous parts of the plot, as well as most games from 2017. I'd highly recommend it. It's not much, but I was trying... This And this is uh, what he added later. I'm just trying to stay vague at the time. For example, that last paragraph is more about, writing, about referring to the writing that appears in the background and often mingles and interacts with what you see on screen. It's great stuff. And well, that's a lovely little opener. Thank you for that, Jonas. And what did Wacker Jr. have to add there? Mike. I'm going to not refer him to as Wacker anymore. I'm going to call him Mike. <laughs> what did uh, Mike have to add there? Uh, so Mike said, uh, I downloaded What Remains of Edith Finch following Lee's recommendation in a previous podcast. And it, to be honest, that's probably why I probably picked it up as well. Uh, but hadn't played it, hadn't yet played it. Thankfully, Pod Pals gave me a great excuse to finally play all the way through this engaging game. Engaging, so positive speeches so far. <laughs> so the be I suppose the best way to tackle this game is to go through by chapter by chapter, as Edith Finch does. And after Nick finished it, he said he missed a few chapters, and I was quite surprised at that because I, I suppose the first time I've played through it twice now, once just to refresh myself for this Pod Pals episode, and the first time I played through it, I was being really meticulous, and it felt very linear in its kind of layout mm -hmm. as you progress through the house. Certain areas are blocked off, and you can only particularly go down. You could, yes, you could go downstairs or upstairs, but then as you go downstairs, there's nowhere else you can basically go until you find the right path to follow. How did you find that, Greg? Um, yeah, like you say, it's it's very linear, and like to be honest, the game, even though there aren't that many ways to go, really, the game does have a good, like, it finds good ways just to lead you along the right path. Um, I know that, like in particular, there's a bit later on where, like, you sort of like you go through a door to to reach a certain part of the story, and then like you have to turn back. And as you're turning back, you see another way to go, which you didn't see as you were yeah. going through the first time. I know it went um, it's up high on the house, that isn't it? Yes. yes uh huh. So like, I thought that was very well done for the most part um and there's a, a few other examples of that through throughout the house um so that was good like i almost did probably the opposite of you lee and the fact that i sort of went through the game like very directly the first time and then as i was playing it the second time i tried to sort of like ex try to explore a wee bit more and take in a few more of the the optional things um 
and the first example of that was actually in the very opening segment as you're walking towards the house for the first time which to be honest is uh i would say it's almost an off-putting sort of opening because of how slowly yeah. <laughs> you, how slowly edith walks around and you actually like you're basically walking along a path just up to the house and like opening opening the gate or whatever but there's a wee small path to the left that takes you down to sort of like almost like a stream or something i think like it a little is brook isn't it yes there's yeah. absolutely nothing down there yeah so like and but but it does if you follow the path along down the stream it leads you back around to the original path anyway so you end it. up yeah you end up um in, like in a fork in the road you could go back that way as well you end up in exactly the same place as you're looking up to the house and you see the narration coming up and going oh this is my family house you end up there so oh, that that's interesting i said that puts a slightly different perspective on that area for me then because when i went down like i, I actually didn't see the the way forwards so i turned and went back up the slope so i thought it was just a dead end down there which was strange so that one's on me Funnily so, enough, the first time I played it, I dropped down there and thought it was a dead end, and then I followed the path around. The second time I played it, I thought, "Not come on, why Edith Finch is is, is not about exploration, mm-hmm. but why are they put this down?" And yes, I found the path the second on my second playthrough. So yeah, it it, it is there, and I thought, and not knowing where it would lead, and when when I came out, and it's like, ah, oh, yes, it, it's a, there's only one path down there as well, mm-hmm. but it is slightly hidden. So we, we've alluded to some of these things already. It is a walking simulator. There is that narration which appears. What I quite liked with the narration, and you said that um, you're kind of pulled towards places, and the narration mm-hmm. does that. Yep. As you get mm-hmm. to an area, and this narration, just these words appear in the air, as, and said as, as, it's said, as she's speaking them, your, your camera is automatically pulled to look at that, which kind of, like you said, forces you mm-hmm. to go in that direction. Did you like the way yeah. they did that? Yes, I did. I actually think that was quite masterfully done. Like, yes. Obviously, like we said, there isn't that much in many ways to explore, but you could go in different directions if you really wanted to, but like it kept sort of pulling you towards that way. And like every, I think every single word of dialogue in the game is is written up on the screen. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, that was good. What did you make of the narration overall? And the voiceover as well. I'm thinking of the voiceovers in particular. You know, the the, the act voice acting. Um. So yeah, like, obviously we haven't got into the story of it yet, but there are like, obviously there's different characters' stories that you have to go through. So there is like a, a range of different characters who will like vocalize their their stories, and I think it was all very well done. Like I said, like I've already spoken in this podcast about not really being in games for stories generally. But I did think it was very well done in this here. I, I can lose myself in a good movie. As long as a movie can put me into its place and keep me there. And and th- this is how I felt with What Remains of Edith Finch. And not many games have done this to me. The, the narration was and the, the voice acting was so good that it did put me in that house or, 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 its, or its environment and maintain my empathy you know I, I did feel part of i didn't feel like i was edith finch but i felt like it was part of a story which was one of the amazing things so i'm gonna start off with mike what we've just been talking about walking simulators he had this to say i haven't played many walking simulator games before and was thrown at the beginning by being forced to move at such a slow dawdle is which is what you said yes as you walking down that path first of all you kind of wanted to click the the r stick to run it's kind of <laughs> I was pressing all sorts of buttons. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it is very slow. First of all, but you, you you kind of as you're in these enclosed spaces in the house, it kind of makes sense to be moving at that pace as well. Uh, a few minutes in, and once I enter the house, any concerns about movement speed evaporated. Just like I said, as the story and activities move along at a brisk pace, even the protagonist herself doesn't. Everything is cleverly designed and linked so close together that there's little time wasted between sections. What did Julius have to add? Um, Julius had quite right. a few things to say there, from what yeah, I can tell. He, did. Uh, he said, it's uh, not only short, but it's brilliantly paced and directed. You're always engaged by doing something while they're playing through a short segment as a member of the Finch family, looking around for how to make it through to the next room, or just interacting with the environment, but it never feels overwhelming. 
the game forces your perspective a bit throughout like again like we said keeping paths or stairs uh, just barely out of sight until you looked around um, something I don't think really mentioned with this game is how there aren't any controls pointed out to you and you just kind of feel your way around the controller to figure things out and I really love that I'll um, stop and you I, there, that is something yeah. we will talk about probably with each chapter and all that but it, it's amazing, yeah it doesn't, like like I said in the beginning you're clicking the right stick to see what you can do and run and what, how you can mm-hmm. do it yeah, it doesn't tell you any of the controls yeah, and that's good because I think like um if button prompts flashed up on the screens of how to do things, it would completely take away um, a lot of what the game is going for, really. But like everything you do, like it sort of feels natural in a way because you do like it. You don't spend ages going, oh, "I have no idea what to do here." It's like if with the controller in your hand, you kind of just feel your way around it, and it, yeah, like I've got no complaints about that either. Like it's. I'll take the first, the, the, the kind of tutorial of movement. Yes, you walk up to um, a mailbox mm-hmm. and then you, you click to interact with it um, and then she interacts with it and she holds a hand out mm-hmm. and then it's just, your hand is just staying there. So you move the oh, you move the cursor, her hand moves. So then, okay, I've got to pull down the latch. So I pull down on the cursor and, and then it pulls down and then she automatically then collects the letters. So yeah, that that's, acts as a tutorial for the rest of the game mm-hmm. there. It, it is context sensitive and every kind of action that you do is a kind of trial and error but it is intuitive it, it does make mm-hmm. complete sense in in, in its um, way it moves so what th- there's something about the unfinished swan I don't know anyway Ju- what else did Julia say there um, so I said um, also um, I don't know if it was just that I had something to focus on while walking around the house when compared with how the unfinished swan surround you in a sea of white but I didn't find myself feeling nauseous at all playing this, which is definitely something I feel is worth mentioning as someone who normally takes a bit of time to adjust to first-person perspectives in games. I've never had problems with first-person games making me feel nauseous or anything, so I, I can't speak to that, but maybe it's because of the pace of the game as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't had problems with that either. Um, I will say maybe it's a good time to sort of mention that in that opening segment, I'm not sure what it's like on the Switch. I was playing it on on the PS5. The frame rate doesn't feel quite right in that opening seg- section. There's Someone the- mentioned that later on as well about the frame rate. I think it was oh, Julius. There were atmosphere and soundtrack. We'll talk about that now. Um, but oh, he okay. mentioned it about PS5 as well. When I was playing it on Switch, I didn't notice anything. Mm-hmm. There's obviously a visual downgrade, but I didn't notice any jitteriness or, 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 or kind of frame rate drops or, or, or kind of you know frame drops or anything in it yeah. um, maybe the occasional one upon opening a door or something like that but nothing to nothing game breaking that's for sure yeah oh no it certainly wasn't a big deal it just it was yeah. definitely noticeable in the opening section as you're plodding along and it was it wasn't it probably wasn't the most impressive opening yeah. <laughs> because of that but I'm wondering because yeah. it's, a, it's a bigger open space maybe that um, obviously the game code so Nick our very young Nick has this to say Edith Finch and he kind of sums up his thoughts first of all he says I, I try to pair back and, and add these some of his thoughts later on as well but he said Edith Finch is inoffensive a passive experience oh that's quite nice was my main thought on a couple of occasions the voice acting was really really good as well lots of atmosphere I wanted to explore more would have been happy with that so he feels that um what i said you know it's, it's very linear he, he wanted to go off the beaten path and see more of the house than was shown really enjoyed that but uh, not usually up to this standard in games and he was talking about the voice acting then he said the voice acting is is a, an excellent addition to the title so what you were alluding to there about the ps5 frame rate julius has added do you want to read that greg um, yeah sure uh to get the things I don't like about the game out of the way first, on a technical level, I played it on my PS5 through backwards compatibility, and the frame rate dips were very noticeable at times, which took me out of my immersion in a dark room with headphones on, something I find myself rarely doing. How did you play it out of general interest? Any headphones? Uh, no, I, I just played it on the, the TV. I think the first time I played it actually uh, was before I had my sound system. And then the second time was with the sound system, and I think, I think the atmosphere did feel better the second time around. 
I played it with headphones a second time and yeah those little incidental details and the, the, um, what did you make of the soundtrack I think the soundtrack was quite um, mesmeric even if it was quite a lot of the same music being reworked as you go through the game um, I, I, to be honest I don't feel like the soundtrack particularly stood out for me and that, that may be seen as a good or a bad thing like it obviously wasn't intrusive um it was very orchestral, you know, and very yeah. uh, melancholic, playing in the background. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it certainly fit it with with the game and the atmosphere. It didn't, it certainly didn't detract from from the experience in any way. So Julius then went on to say that um, if anybody ever comes up to him and says that storytelling, Greg might come up to him and say storytelling is no place in video <laughs> games. He said, then this is where he'll be pointing them in future. He says, no, no storytelling doesn't have a place in video games get over and play What Remains of Edith Finch. <laughs> he says because he thinks it's the best and briefest example of what I think introspective video game sto- storytelling aims for. To make the player empathetic um, because you can actually, in a virtual space, put them in someone else's shoes. So we've walked down the, the, the main promenade, we've picked up our letters, we've gone up to, up to the house and the front door doesn't open. We end up going through the side and using a cat flap um, we crawl through there and we enter the house for the first time and Nick has this to say about the house the mansion was superbly designed I wanted to explore it more and uncover little secrets like Resident Evil as it was, it was a single path where you just experienced the next bit so I think that was a bit of a um, slight praise with a with a slap in the face as well <laughs> then, Greg <laughs> Um, yeah, I suppose it depends what you're, you're in it for, really. Yeah. Like, I was actually happy to be, like, led along the path because I kind of felt like the way the game was, if I was sort of, like, forced to, forced to explore just to, to find my find the next thing to interact with or whatever would take the next part of the story forward, like, I think it would have been a worse, ex- worse experience overall for me. Like, I actually liked my sort of hand being held through the journey i suppose yeah same here it kept it briefer and as as i i because i was meticulous first of all especially exploring the downstairs as you get inside and looking around at the cans of tuna and and the pictures on the fridge you know there's a picture of the family there and then, then there's a there's a funeral um uh invitation basically um on the fridge for lewis and we find out who lewis is later so if you if you kind of spend the time to look at these environmental details you'll notice a lot and pick up a lot about these family members and especially how they look as well before you even get into the first chapter and the first chapter we both came across was molly you end up um going up you, all the rooms are locked you end up going to the second floor uh her second floor in uh Taiwan's the first floor, isn't it? Ground floor in the, we just gone for the ground floor. So you go up to the first floor of the Finch house and all the bedrooms are locked, but they got peepholes. Did you uh, sneak a look in all the peepholes before you uh, pushed forward? Um, first time around, no. I may have peeked in the, the, the first peephole, but no, don't remember really <laughs> any <laughs> after that. On my second playthrough, and this was because there was a, uh, and also there was an achievement for looking through all the peepholes. I ah. did I did look through them all. See, this is something that was missing from a Switch version. There was no achievements, unfortunately. So there was nothing to tell you what to do. You just went and did it. So it wasn't, I didn't look through the, all the peepholes until my second playthrough and knowing that I could after finding out later on in the game. But you ended up going through uh, Walter's bedroom and one of the side bedrooms and then finding a secret passage and finding your way through to Molly's room. Now, Molly was uh, the hungry girl, I put her down here. She lived from 1937 to 1947, 10 years old when she passed. And this is where the, the kind of meat of Edith Finch starts. It puts you in the shoes of someone else by reading the diary, and then you become that person. And if you look at the incidental details, you look at Molly's hand, She's got some disease of something. I don't know if it's chicken pox or something worse because she's got really grey skin and she's covered in pox. So she's ill from the uh, from the outset of this um, start of the beginning of this thing. She's locked in her room. Her mother's locked her in the room. She can't get out, but she's very hungry. What did you make of this um, chapter, Greg? In a way, I thought it was a, a strange opening and if anything 
almost made me worried about what the game was going to be like going forward. Um, because, like, obviously, like, the girl, uh, Molly, like, she's going around the room and, like, she's so hungry and she's, she's like, eating toothpaste and whatnot because yeah. she, she's so hungry. Like She's eating the berries off the holly thing, which yeah, would probably be poisonous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, like, in a way, like, I sort of felt like... Um, Obviously, what the game is about is like finding out how all these people, like in the family, like came to meet their end, really. Yeah. <laughs> and like, as I was going through Molly's story, like, and she ends up like going out through the window to like chase a bird or whatever, and oh, like now I'm a, I'm a cat or whatever. Yeah. I can't remember if there's something before that. Before you. No, she she them. becomes a cat immediately to chase the sparrow. Yep. She and catches point, a sparrow in the tree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Carry on. Yep. Um, I can't remember each each stage of it. I know she turned into an owl as well to go down. Like Yeah, after, after eating the thing, she turned into an owl. Then she would mm-hmm. swoop down to catch rabbits. Mm-hmm. Then she'd pick up a bigger rabbit. Then she turned into a shark. Yep. Which you fl- belly flopped because you weren't in the ocean, into the ocean. Then she swam all the way eating uh, seals. Mm-hmm. I just love the narration. I don't know. It's this child, ch- and and the the way they've written what the child is saying is so childlike as well. I teach children mm-hmm. of that age. Yeah, it it's just got such a flavour of truth to how a child would have spoke spoken mm-hmm. about this imaginary scene of how <laughs> delicious the seals' flipper tastes, and then I've got to have yeah. more. And then she turns into the sea monster and boards mm-hmm. the ship. And every one of these all controls differently. Mm-hmm. The sea monster in particular, like the shark is pretty straightforward. He's left and right on the analog stick and then you press the ZR, I think, to, to dash forward to do a lunging attack. But then as you're the sea monster, you move forward with the L stick, but the camera's not moving and you move in this tentacle. But then when you hold the ZR, it kind of latches his sucker on and then pulls what your camera, your head is, pulls it towards the beginning of that tentacle so like I said with this trial and error kind of element of each so even within different chapters within one chapter they've got all these separate kind of um, control schemes as well so as you're this tentacle you end up eating all the people on the ship and then you end up dropping back into the ocean and this is one of my favourite things about about the game which I I, I just love this kind of um, reverence towards not insanity but metaphorical kind of nature um, you end up going down this tunnel and ending up in Molly's room and under Molly's bed and then you go back to being Molly and Molly's like shh I can hear it under my bed uh-huh. it's gonna wait until I fall asleep and, <laughs> and I, I'm gonna fall asleep and I know one thing I taste delicious <laughs> and yeah. it just ends on that and this, I just knew this game was for me after that chapter mm-hmm. well I suppose, actually, just speaking about there, like obviously, like in my like desire to sort of like know what had happened to to Molly, like as she was going through each of these stages, like and like you say, obviously, like it is like sort of spoken in the way like a child would speak, because like I I've got young boys of my own, and like Jacob, he's four, like and he would make up stories like if he's playing and stuff, like and. You sort of wonder why they make connections with certain things, and I wonder why he thinks like, <laughs> yeah, that seems logical in his head and stuff. So, I, I completely like that resonated with me definitely, but I didn't really see um, what um, what the her story was was going for as such in the way that she like died because I didn't really make the connections between what the abstract nature of the story was trying to, to convey but now that you like I do remember the line about being delicious and stuff and obviously you've spoken about her looking very pale and stuff like I'm now making that connection that obviously like something was actually like eating away or something yeah. like whatever yeah. disease she had was eating away at her and that's what, what ultimately killed her so that it's interesting to make that revelation just <laughs> just right at this moment. Um, there, there seems... To, well, I, I, I don't want to spoil something later, but Edith's mother as well is something wrong with her later, and it could be something that 
is pervasive in the DNA of this family and causing them, at least a few of them, to um, uh, die at a very young age. Um, yeah. Especially Molly. So yeah, I, I, Molly. It, it doesn't. It's not implicit in that. Oh, it, of course the monster didn't eat her. But um, <laughs> yeah, like you say, something's eating away at her, and um, she died at ten years old. Yeah, I didn't. Um, we we sort of briefly mentioned the audio earlier and the aspect of it, but like um, as you're talking about the sea monster there, like, I sort of saw it as a snake in my head for some reason because it kind of is like yeah yeah most um, like a snake yeah. But like as you're moving around, like and creeping up on these people on the ship, like the music that sort of plays in the background there is the sort of thing that um, I would associate with sort of like making a creepy atmosphere, like that old style music, and just uh, I felt it worked very well there, and it kind of almost made me want like a game in that sort of like with that sort of soundtrack playing like throughout, kind of because it felt very twisted or something. Yeah, I th- I think uh, especially this chapter and it, it is, it I, I like that kind of twisted nature to movies as well. I like a lot of David Lynch films. I like coming away from movies sometimes and thinking, I don't understand that. I'm gonna have to watch it again and um, and then taking something out of it. And this first chapter did that. So you end up coming out of Molly's room because you 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 end up climbing out the window don't you and then you you end up coming back into the house and uh, you find out something in Grandpa Sam's room about Odin I can't yeah it is Grandpa Sam's room I believe you find about Odin who was the um, original uh, finch basically that put his house on a boat and sailed it <laughs> to America wherever they came from I can't remember Um, He lived from 1880 to 1937, whereupon it was set upon by a storm, the house sank in the harbour, and the remainder of the family, Edie, who is Edith's grandmother, was one of the original survivors, managed to get ashore to this island and then start a new house. So Odin lasted until 1937, so he was fleeing something, maybe, who knows. But we don't know much about him. Mm-hmm. So we'll move on to another very short chapter, very touching, but it does it with, like the first one as well, this humour which takes you, just ever takes the edge of the the death away from it in one line. It's just one line that's dropped and it just adds so so much to the to what happened to Calvin. Calvin was alive from 1950 to 1961. He was Grandpa Sam's twin. We'll talk about Grandpa Sam later. This is a room you go into, and it's got um, um, a line down the middle, like um, like a, 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 a waiting line to segment, waiting lines into two, like a red rope. And Grandpa Sam lived on one side of the room, and, and Calvin, his twin, lived on the other side of the room, and his, his side of the room had been roped off by Edie, the grandmother, and um, not touched so you can work your way through and find in um, in a in a astronaut's visor a letter telling you the history about calvin what did uh, julia say there greg and um, julia said um something i don't think really mentioned with this game is how there aren't any controls pointed out to you uh, we do that, although yeah. we, we mentioned it earlier yeah. <laughs> and you kind of just feel your way around the controller to figure things out and i really love that and um, using the triggers to swing it back and forth to get higher and higher as calvin comes to mind as i type this it was such an instinctive thing and uh, i think it was maybe the sticks rather than the yeah, <laughs> rather yeah the two the triggers, analog but, sticks yeah yeah um i'm sure most of us figured out pretty much immediately uh Oh, maybe I've read that wrong. It was sorry. No, it was such right. an instinctive thing. Yeah. I'm sure most of us figured it out pretty much immediately, uh, which is amazing, especially considering I feel this is something all of the levels have in common, and uh, we kind of touched on that anyway. And that's that's how we felt. Yeah, and with Calvin, he, he's he's a, you see him through Calvin's eyes, and he's on the swing, and he's got a broken leg. He's one of his legs is in plaster, and the brother is in the narrator talking about how Calvin said he was going to fly one day. Mm-hmm. And the the swing is positioned in such a place that it's uh, a top, a perched atop of a cliff top. Uh, so as you swing, you end up swinging off the edge of the cliff and then swinging back. And you are trying to get higher and higher and higher. 
and the throwaway line that made me smile is is along the lines of the brother grandpa sam saying um calvin said he would never uh, calvin said he would die before he would eat another mushroom and he did <laughs> um yeah and as you're swinging higher and higher it comes to a point where you're trying to do a 360 he does manage to do a 360 and launches himself off the edge of the cliff mm-hmm. how did you find how did you feel about that one um so again this like the feeling of um moving the sticks like you could really feel the momentum building and building um, but it was one of those things where like I kind of felt like I struggled a bit again with like um, taking taking it literally versus being some sort of more metaphorical thing because like often like no one would build a, a swing there it's so <laughs> yeah. dangerous surely but look at their house um, <laughs> Um, but I kind of liked the whole like um, obviously like the stories hidden like under the astronaut's helmet or whatever and like how he would love to fly and stuff and like at the end of it obviously when he flies off the swing into the <laughs> into the sea or whatever he does fly um, so I thought I thought it was okay it was uh, obviously very short there's nothing to do outside of just that swinging but like the storytelling of what happened like was pretty good but again like I, do, I don't know how he died exactly. Did he just swing mm. off a cliff, or is Did he it just fall off a cliff? Or yeah, yeah. we we'll... or is it or is it trying to tell us something else that I ha- haven't connected? I if you haven't connected it, I haven't connected it with that one either. But I take this one as being a little bit more literally. Um, you know, he ended up launching himself <laughs> off of a cliff somehow. And he has perished. Mm-hmm. So you end up coming out of that room um, through another secret passage. There's lots of secret passages. There's something, a lever to pull in this one, I believe, behind a bookcase. And you end up going into um, another tunnel which leads through to Barbara's room. Now, she lasted a bit longer. She was 1944 to 1960. She was the childhood star. And while Calvin's uh, chapter was very, very short, over in literally a minute and a half, if you could work the controls out to swing the swing, um, Barbara's was a little bit longer because as you went into her room, instead of a diary there, there was um, a, a horror story comic book. And then her story is told through the comic book and the narrator being this pumpkin-headed, um, <laughs> just like Krill, tips, uh, Tales from the Crypt or something like that, you know, some monstrous incarnation. And Barbara being a childhood star of horror movies and having a wonderful scream, the comic book follows her through to her untimely murder. There's a section in it which feels like Halloween. It even takes John Carpenter's Halloween music and places it in the game. And at points of playing that, I felt the atmosphere for creepiness did come through. And I... Not to the point where I saw the, 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 what was it, the refrigerator shuffle, but the bit building up to that, the music and everything leading up to that point mm-hmm. was really well done again. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Like the, um, like the contrast kind of between like the comic book style of the, like the presentation along with the clearly like dark nature of the tale that is kind of being told I thought worked really well and like you say the music there kind of added to that as well yeah it's a pretty memorable chapter for me like obviously like it definitely lasted longer than the, the previous chapter and it was nice to like obviously like the first two chapters were like the controls and stuff were all quite different but it was kind of like all kind of in the same wheelhouse to, to go off on a tangent so kind of early on in the game as well I thought that definitely made made me interested to see what else they would do throughout the rest of the game. Um, but yeah, again, I enjoyed the story, and it's one that obviously, like, she gets eaten by like <laughs> the monsters <laughs> at the end, yeah. which is obviously not what happened to her. Um, it also says it, her boyfriend was apprehended for the murder, so I 
take it as maybe it was the boyfriend um see there's there's that aspect of it but then it's like her desire to be famous and like yeah. maybe like do whatever it takes kind of to to make that true and then just like her fans or whatever like and in some sort of way would end up contributing to her death in some way i don't know or maybe it's it's a way of looking at like um obviously she was this famous star and then she obviously like her famousness disappeared and then maybe like whatever her mental situation was like in terms of like not being able to cope with like i suppose maybe rejection and whatnot there's a few different ways to sort of interpret what what kind of happened there but i like i thought it was uh, another pretty decent chapter it's it's it's, it's these things see, every every t- I, it's, it's one of these things with a good movie when you come you bring to a good movie your own baggage and you can see a, a good movie in a completely different way from someone else and, and and interpret it in a completely different way and i believe every single chapter here as well can be interpreted in a in a different way and even if i was in a different mood while playing it compared to a different mood when i played it earlier or if i had gone through a slightly different experience before playing it i would interpret it differently myself as well so i can see this as a game that i'd come back to maybe in five or ten years time and play through again just to see how i feel about it then as well but um jonah said a horror storybook in the comic and then julius added barbara's comic book style murder was brilliantly done as well and i really think the narration went a long way to settling the tone throughout that segment all the levels just feel so unique and even if they're certainly stronger than others a lot of the weaker ones are on the shorter end so this is uh, so it's hard to complain so and uh, nick said the comic book horror story was uh, quite good as well lots of tension when you got to play and i i, I did feel the tension it was uh, slightly scary that's for sure when the when the killer fell off the edge and uh, or you were sneaking around the back of him he fell over the edge and then disappeared um we ended up then down in the basement uh they, they'd alluded to this character called walter and edie the grandmother had said that he had disappeared and edith's mother as well had also said this uh, walter disappeared we find out later there's a secret bunker basically in the in the basement where Walter had been living from 1952, well, he was born in 1952, but had been living until 2005. He was the boy who apparently saw Barbara. He was in that um, CGI. He was the boy under the bed hiding from the murderer in that Barbara thing. So he had been psychologically scarred by whatever he had seen, Mm -hmm. couldn't deal with life, and now has been not, not against his will, but he has chosen to live away from people. And as you go down the bunker and become Walter, he's got this repetitive, every single day is the same. <laughs> every single he's opening a can of peaches and he, mm-hmm. and he drinks the peaches. And there's this rumbling, like an earthquake. And you're thinking, what's that? And he thinks it's a monster. He's, he's, he's like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to go out there. There's this monster. And um, it comes to 2005 and it's been months and this rumbling has stopped. So he has been digging a way out for a long time from what you you follow as Walter. And he finally finds the last part of it, a wall, and knocks a hole through it and ends up on a railway track. Promptly walks down the railway track and is talking about his freedom and maybe starting a new life and promptly gets run over by a train. (laughs) Um... Jonas, what did Jonas say about that before we say what we think, Greg? Um, so Jonas said, um, I also appreciate how every death seems so abstract, um, nor was the paranoid bunker man run by a train. So he says he doesn't think he was run down by a train. Right. Yeah. Well, when you saw how like he came out of the bunker and like the obviously like the railway track is just going directly into it, it's obviously not like a literal thing there um but he came out he came out of the bunker through a hole in the wall above mm-hmm. the the rail tunnel mm-hmm. the railway carried on down down into the railway tunnel which you couldn't go because it's you know it's it's walled off no, there's no wall there it's it's literally game walled off it's just like a black thing so you couldn't walk down it but the railroad track did continue down there mm-hmm 
and it isn't until you become Edith Finch and you walk down the other end of the railroad track and find that the track does have an end but it's like broken off because it, the cliff face has fallen and collapsed where the ra- where the track track used to be and the track does continue around the the, uh, the as if as if maybe quite possibly up to 2005 there could have been a little railway going around this little island um not a hundred percent clear as jonas has said what else did he say um he said you're you're always left wondering what exactly happened sure what matters is that those deaths are symbolic Mm. and i guess the poetry of it all is what i appreciate what did you take away from that i i yes it could be a poetic death but also i i did see where the railroad was going so i thought Mm -hmm. well quite possibly there was a railroad yeah i guess again it's one of those that kind of gets you thinking like you're going through that like living a life ruled by fear yeah and you can either take it really as that he finally did um get the courage to to try and escape this his life and eventually make something of of his life rather than spend the rest of his days obviously down in this basement or you can kind of look at it as I can't I just can't live like this anymore and I need to to, to find a way out one way or another which takes it down a, an even darker path Dark, in a way yeah. yeah. and then like I kind of always I suppose in a way I kind of seen the, the, like the train like the being in the tunnel and like the train coming and the, the, the lights kind of seen as like the <laughs> heavenly almost yeah like seeing the light as, as it yeah. were I always wonder if they ever found any bodies you know are these people dead did Walter get away did uh, you 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 know you never know yeah. um, see like I you mentioning Walter being like under the bed um, for what happened to Barbara like I didn't actually make that connection and it's something that I actually probably struggled with throughout the game even though you have that like family tree mapped out and the, the posh screen stuff and like obviously Edith draws in what happened to each each of the family members like because there was such like a range of characters and their names were all being like spoken every like few seconds like I find it difficult to like figure out where each one like sort of stood in like the the family tree um so obviously like she was mentioning like Edie most yeah. of the time like but all these other characters like I I couldn't quite decipher where they were um just b- based on what like she was saying like obviously when you like investigate and look into like their like when they lived and when they died and stuff you can piece it all together but it, it, that's something you had i felt that you had to probably go like hunting for rather than like being able to like immediately connect everything together from the off and and a, a second playthrough as well will help that as well you know consolidate who's what because as you're watching the barbara scene again she's like walter where are you walter and she's shouting walter's name as well a, a mm-hmm. few times and um she mentions that she's babysitting walter and the name it is name dropped yes and if, if you're playing through the first time i didn't make that connection either it wasn't until like you say researching it and researching it but looking into these writing people's names down and all that for this podcast pod pals and then playing it the second time as well that those connections do come become very clearer so you can see he was very psychologically disturbed from whatever happened to him that night and never quite overcame it and you end up then following that train track and then the train track veers off it breaks like i said there's the the cliff has fallen away and the train track carries on but you end up going to the left and the train track's gone to the right you end up going to a cemetery which has been built just for the finches um, up, up on t- top of a ridge uh looks very similar to where calvin would have had his swing um you find milton's grave there and you find that he's not dead he's just got a question mark we'll, we'll come back to that later because milton comes in later and it's as you're climbing to the top there the big bombshell is dropped that edith finch is actually 22 weeks pregnant did you know before she said um i uh, for me i didn't uh, it was a bombshell um 
I ended up thinking, why are you climbing around this house like this, 22 <laughs> weeks pregnant girl? Yep. The first time, no, I, I probably didn't know until she said she was pregnant. Um, the second time I played it, I noticed a couple of things that were said before she explicitly said she was pregnant that sort of yeah. like made me think, oh, why didn't I realize that the first time? Um, and if you yeah, pan the camera down, yep. you can see her bump as well, which which mm-hmm. I didn't even notice until she said she's pregnant. You look down, oh, she yep. has a bump. Yeah. So... Jonas um, said this. I like that small hints are scattered from the beginning. Sure, we see that Edith's brother was missing, not dead. Uh, this is Milton. But we also see a lot about air vents and secret passages. Yeah, Milton was the one who was investigating the passages. We see lots of drawings in passages. That's all due to Milton. He was the artist. We'll talk about him very shortly. Also, I wonder how many people actually looked down to see that Edith's pregnant long before she revealed it. I certainly didn't. I happened to accidentally send the camera downwards at the beginning and saw the swollen bell- belly super early. I even wondered if it was just a matter of a weird perspective or some, <laughs> some sort of a glitch of the game. Uh, what about uh, Mike and Nick? Uh, so Mike percent? said, uh, oh, good spot. I had moved the camera down, but I never twigged. I kicked myself when she revealed that. Um, but Nick says he also noticed that she was pregnant immediately. Yeah, Nick. On, on, the, on the money there, Nick. Um... <laughs> So that is climbing to the house, and as you come back into the house, you end up going through one of the. Um, you end up climbing on the roof of one up, up a ladder and into Grandpa Sam's room, which is like a a patio, saying the sliding door. And nobody has said anything about Grandpa Sam. He's a camera enthusiast. Yeah, you find out that he's got um, a, um, a developing room, basically like a red light room, um, and you go through his story all through the lens of a camera. And this one I found a little bit awkward to f- find how to, how, how to focus, first of all, and what was he supposed to be focusing on. Because you can move the camera through about 180 degrees in a lot of these shots, and you had to focus on a particular thing before taking the photo to progress the story. But the, the story carries on with it. He's taking his daughter on a tr- hunting trip. She shoots a deer. She's crying. He puts his camera on a timer, and then from there you control Sam to run up the cliff... Yeah to the deer which moves <laughs> unfortunately for Sam it moves in such a direction that um, it knocks him off the edge of the cliff and he's another one who can fly <laughs> what this, did you make is, of that? this is one that I did just take uh, yeah. literally, literally like yes. as as it happened um, yeah I was kind of like you in terms of like uh, what you had to focus on it reminded me of uh, All or M Metroid or M where you had those you had to like hunt and put place the cursor on like a specific sort of pixel almost. Just single pixel, yeah. It was it was like that in a way. Um so yeah, particularly in the first part where I think you have to focus on the girl in the car. Yeah. Whoever that whoever that is again. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure what her name was. Sam's daughter. I've forgotten who Who is Sam's daughter? I don't know. Uh, we'll find out who Sam's daughter is later. Um, and then she takes control of the camera, and this is a nice little brevity moment where she takes a photo of a dad peeing against a tree. And <laughs> But yeah, far more literal in that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought so anyway. Yeah, she... Uh, Grandpa Sam. Th- this, this was the weird thing about Grandpa Sam. When you looked at the photos in the room, he was like a grandpa. He was old. Mm-hmm. But when you look at his age, he lived from 1950 to 1983. He was only 33 years old when he died. Mm-hmm. And something didn't quite sit right about that. Did he Did he survive that fall? But why would it say only 33 that he passed? I, I, I found that very strange. Well, obviously, and like in the in the chapter, he doesn't. Like, he looks 33. He's not yes. old. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure about the pictures that were up on the the walls if they were like almost in a way like dedicated to like real people or something in some areas um, as the Edith Finch developers families or something yeah maybe but like yeah I, I, I actually never really made that connection with the like the disparity in age there but it's an interesting point uh, we move on then uh, straight through a little um, an- another secret. There's too many secret hidden 
always <laughs> but um, you end up going to find out what happened to Gregory and it's this um, shared dormitory of a room where it's got a, a got a few story it's got two stories I believe isn't it Gregory's the first one you come across in in order you can do them in any order Gregory was the youngest of the Finches to um, pass away from 1976 to 1977 one year old and this one is told from the perspective of a bathtub completely mm -hmm. um, Jonas said a baby's imagination in a bath what did Julia say about it Greg uh, so Julia said it's brilliant storytelling and it's brilliant level design and while it's my favorite example of it in the game there are certainly other strong levels Gregory's drowning while incredibly bleak for his age and also considering what his parents were going through with the divorce fully erupts into a fantasiesque sequence by, by Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers and it's so colourful and brilliant and the only case that I remember in the game where we get to experience a bit more than a sudden cut to black in his death it's almost as if Gregory died peacefully at least when compared to at least compared to at least compared with others, other deaths in the game. I was quite um, shocked that they were going to take it here. You know, you you saw this and you saw the mother neglecting him because she was on the phone and thinking, "Oh my God, you don't want to be turning your back on a baby." This, you you can see what's happening. And I think a lot of the the, the game, it foreshadows. You know what's going to happen, and you're waiting for it to play out. And there's this wonderful yeah. movie called Barry Lyndon by uh, Stanley Kubrick that does that. Uh, it tells you what's going to happen, and then it watches you, makes you forces you to watch and see how how you get to that point that it's just told you about, and that's what happens on this one. And the kind of Fantasia esque uh, sequence is is especially toward the end is when the baby goes underwater and becomes a frog and uh, heads towards the, the 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 sink hole, the plug hole. So yes, incredibly bleak, and I thought they're going to take it here, but they did it in a way which removed all bleakness from the actual event. Yeah, well, obviously, like as you're entering that chapter, it's like a divorce paper that you're yeah. you're reading. So like, the parents are obviously <laughs> going through something, and did they go through the divorce before or after the child's death? I took it that it would have happened after but that was my reading of it because the father was going oh to the to the mother saying things like um oh don't blame yourself for the for the death yeah well presumably it would have probably happened after but the the breakup was certainly <laughs> had happened already um but, but i mean as soon as the scene opened up and you were sitting in the bathtub like you knew immediately what was going to happen yeah. and there was that brief moment where like uh the mother comes in and like turns the like um pulls the plug out and you think oh maybe maybe they are gonna throw us off but then obviously get she gets distracted again by the phone call and then it's like well it's inevitable what <laughs> what's gonna happen here and like as parents ourselves like i'm sure you're probably the same like you're constantly like looking out for the dangers <laughs> for your child and like you would never dream of leaving them in the bath alone so yeah it's, it's a sad tale but like yeah again it's sort of looking into that sort of like as we've seen with like the first chapter like the kid's imagination that's again in focus here like i wonder what like the, the child was thinking as it was all happening it's kind of like i know you say it was sort of like a, almost peaceful in a way it's like it almost makes it more chilling for me like the ch the thought of the child like not knowing what's going on and and stuff and like happily doing this yeah yeah and i suppose it, it, it highlights 1970s as well where things about uh, safety were not in place as they are now and maybe things like this were occurring on a daily basis you know and anyway you know yeah, health, I think, health I think... and safety has come along a long way <laughs> yeah like in terms of gameplay it probably had more of a puzzle element than most of the, the yeah. chapters in terms of and um, platforming as well because you had to bounce off the top you, of the whale at one point didn't you yeah well you had to like gather like rubber ducks together and then you would bounce off them as the frog up to bits higher up and eventually yeah she'd knock the whale down and Ultimately, at the end of it, it's like turning the water on till it fills away up, and that's 
that's the end really poor Gregory poor. moving on to <laughs> yeah sorry Gregory moving on to uh, one of his uh, cousins Gus he was a short life as well 1969 he was born a little bit older than Gregory 1982 he perished and what I saw coming with this as you open the scene it's a kite Mm-hmm. There's a couple of words, you know, appearing in, in the sky and all that. You have to trace the words across with a kite and they fill in the words and then the narration starts. And then it's talking about a storm. I thought, whoo, he's got a kite in a storm, electrocution. Mm-hmm. I thought yep. immediately he's going to be electrocuted. 100%. That did not happen. <laughs> Instead, a, a, a mini freak uh, wind tornado had caught the tent of the wedding and launched it in the direction of Gus where promptly he was swept into the ocean after being entangled with the tent from what I could uh, read of it. He got hurt mm-hmm. pretty badly. Did you enjoy this one, mm. this little chapter? It was very short, wasn't it? It was interesting in the way that you obviously were like having to like gather up the words kind of to, to progress it. It's, a, it's one of those I didn't really take literally, and I'm not really sure what what way I did take it to be honest um, because obviously like his father is is Morian again is that right? it's Morian yeah, <laughs> Morian again yeah it's, his, it's his second marriage yeah and obviously like um, 13 year old you're gonna be at that age which like I don't I don't wanna stay at home or whatever yeah. like you're everything's just you're against everything at that age really um so yeah, kind of flying the kite about, and then everything does kind of like the storm obviously does, does swell up. Um, but I, I didn't really know what what that was going for as such because I I was exactly the same as you. I thought electrocution from the off, but yeah, I don't know. Like we've had instance of drowning obviously in the previous chapter, so I didn't see that as like another instance of it. Like so. Honestly, don't know, don't know what it was about. Yeah, it ended up with um, them finding the body on the beach, and um, nobody missed him until, you know, after after the whole event had happened. Um, Julia says a flying kite as Gus was probably the weakest level for me by some margin. It uh, felt a little uninspired, though it was a neat enough way to mix things up. That's me nitpicking, though. That aside, I absolutely adored this game in total. Um, it, it I think what what was difficult about this is where we talked about the the camera would focus you towards a certain narration point Mm -hmm. it didn't with the kite and sometimes you felt lost not knowing what to do Mm -hmm. so it felt a little aimless so i I agree it it was a slightly weaker one and do we know how gus died well he he died on the beach through you know uh no fault of his own but uh, maybe not looking after himself well enough nick says what did nick say uh, so Nick said the the kite bit was okay, but the controls weren't great. I didn't have a problem with the controls. Yeah, it, it was again. It was kind of one of those like pixel hunting <laughs> yeah. modes yeah. again. I, I thought like um, it wasn't as apparent the second time because you you sort of knew what you were doing. Um, but yeah, certainly the first time it maybe took a a wee minute or two to figure out where to sort of aim the kite and stuff yeah and, and the speed I think uh, what the last tent as you crash the kite into the tent to pick the tent up which ultimately mm-hmm. is uh, Gus's d- demise you kind of have to get it at, at I think at the right speed as well coming into it and at the right angle if you don't catch that if you just touch mm-hmm. the tent nothing happens and it doesn't in- instigate this um, the, the following cutscene so mm-hmm. yeah that was yeah. Yeah, this, see, for me, like, the other kind of perspective and the way of looking at it was, like, um, obviously it's, it's a broken family, and then, like, was the dad focusing more on his relationship with the yeah. his new, new girlfriend, who would be his wife, obviously, rather than concentrating on what the son, that's why the son was left outside during the wedding and stuff. Which is instanced in the the way the father deals with the son as well, which is just shouting at him, Gus, get over here! You know, that kind of thing. You know, what the hell are you doing? He's he's just treating the boy as, as, a, as a punching bag, in a way, uh-huh. you know? He's been very aggressive with him, and then the boy sticks his middle finger up and um, <laughs> doesn't come back. So, yes, you're right there. Yeah, he's, he's been neglected. 
So uh, you finish Gus and you climb higher, you go up into this area with the plant garden and um, there's a classroom up there as well. And it's that part you said where you go through the outside the classroom and then on your right there's a way which you notice when you come back from Milton's room. And I'm not going to read what Julius said there, but about that, because we talked about that, it's about fo focusing your perspective and it's exactly the point that we mentioned uh, you mentioned about the path as well very well designed so you end up in uh, the top of the house the highest part you can get basically um, this is like an observatory and um, you end up going through the window and up, I think it's up and you go up like a pulley system you end up going up to the top and there's a flick book to tell Milton's story this is the boy that has disappeared we don't know if he's died there's a question mark on his grave 1992 to question mark and the flick book is entitled the magic paintbrush and it's over in 30 yeah. seconds and it's you just hold one. you just hold the l stick or r mm. stick whatever it was and you flick through it and he's drawn a doorway mm -hmm. which in the flick book you see the doorway downstairs uh this this because he's an artist of course he's drawn a doorway and then in the flick book he goes through the doorway and doesn't come back. Yeah. So that obviously a metaphorical kind of thing of, I'm out of here. I am leaving the finches and I'm not looking back. Yes, yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I actually quite like the flick book. Um, yeah, it was nice. Um, obviously it was short. There, there wasn't that much to see in it, really. Um, so it did kind of leave it open. Like, is, is he dead? Or is has something happened to him? And like... I actually kind of pulled on my heartstrings <clears throat> a wee bit because I remember being in Ikea one day of all places and like we had Jacob there with us and like Ikea is quite a big place <laughs> quite a big place like and we just happened to be looking at potties for him and within like two seconds he was gone couldn't couldn't see him and the, just the, the panic that sets in when like you, you don't know what's happened like has, has somebody grabbed him uh, you know um, thankfully, like a couple of minutes later, a couple of minutes is a long time when you're. It's a lifetime, and um, it's happened to me as well. Yeah, so like, uh, it kind of makes me think in in terms of this game, like, um, has he just disappeared? Has something happened to him? Like, did he like drown again or something? <laughs> like another drowning victim or something? Or has he been snagged by somebody? And then, then again, you don't know what what would have happened to him in those. Like, is he still alive? Who knows? And we don't. And this is, I suppose, like a good movie. This is the the things you can fill in in your own mind, and you fill in the rest of the story. Okay. For me, he's living in California somewhere with a with a wife, and he's painting the the California Harbor with the seals or whatever he's getting up to. Good on you, Milton. And Jonas all said, it's a flick book. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing much to add there. So the big one, and this this uh, chapter was probably the longest chapter. It was definitely the longest chapter to play through. It um, was Lewis. Lewis. 1988 to 2010. He was... Uh, you, you double back then, and you went down that, up that pathway to the left, like you said, and you ended up on a boat. There's a boat up there. You had to open the boat's window get into the boat and he was obviously using psychotic elements but uh, mostly marijuana you can see a bong on the table there and he was big into India this is Edith Finch's brother now he was from 1988 to 2010 he you see his perspective from his psycho psyche psychiatric report from his psychiatrist and I've entitled this the daydreamer He's obviously had mental health issues and then his psychiatrist is writing to the mother talking about his last moments where he worked at the cannery this is where all those uh, cans of tuna came from it was as if he was getting paid in tuna and you end up doing this monotonous job of moving a tuna with i think it was the l stick wasn't it or the r stick the r stick right stick yeah. r stick yeah the right stick and pushing it to the guillotine, chopping the fish's head off, and then flicking the fish into the conveyor belt to carry on. So you're de-heading fish, that's all he was doing. And then as the story progresses, is him, he starts getting drawn into his imagination more and more and creating this vivid um, alternate reality 
where he becomes a prince, sails to do missions, falls in love with the queen, ends up getting coronated, whereupon his coronation is the other end of a guillotine. <laughs> yeah, you can see him drifting off into this other world and loving this other world far better than this monotony and drudgery of real life. So Jonas had this to say, of course the cannery. There are so many layers to the cannery episode alone for how the adventure gets you more and more detail to how you're always required to chop and fish. So yeah, you're doing things with a left stick, like moving someone down a procession while still chopping the fish the heads off fishes and you know, you're doing uh, two things at once. What did Mike say about that? Uh, so Mike said, I enjoyed how each character's story played out differently, whether it was through graphical style or employing different gameplay mechanics. My favourite was probably Lewis having to control a character through a simple maze with one control stick and the other constantly having to cut the heads off and dispose of fish, even if that section lasted maybe a little too long. Did it overstay its welcome for you? I actually think the length of it added to what the the story was kind of trying to convey um, because I feel like this is probably one of the most memorable ones because in many ways like we can all probably relate to it uh, in some ways because like I know myself like in the in my previous job before I got the one I'm currently in like um, I was there for quite a while and like feeling that like right obviously I need this job to like pay bills and pay for a mortgage and pay for a car and stuff and feeling like I hate this job so much and I have to be in it, like I have to do it, I'm going to do that grind every single day, it's like really like mentally tiring and I felt like there was no way out of it, like I would apply for jobs and I would go go to interviews and stuff and I just could not get a whole job and I was just like feeling completely stuck and trapped in something that's making you like pretty much hate life, like Thankfully, I never got to a stage where I would be. <laughs> I would, it was as dark as where this particular story goes to. But I feel like we've all been in positions where we feel like trapped and not really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I suppose. So the length of this here kind of enhanced that. Oh, like and throughout the entire thing, you are like, like it uses you and Mike and stuff have said constantly flicking that right stick to the right to chop the head off and then forward to, to throw the the fish the rest of the fish away and it's like yeah it's <laughs> just that, that monotony I get like it kind of captured that but, and we've all been there and yeah it captured him because of the length of that um, chapter it did capture his slow descent mm-hmm. into um, another alternate reality through his psychosis you know it, it, it mm-hmm. really just and and even the psychiatrist is saying like I didn't see anything wrong with it because he was doing his job so well mm-hmm. um, and it's just his descent away from reality basically yeah it was it got quite captivating now when Julia said um, this was his favorite level um, is the longest one by some margin I'm not sure it's the one, the one that I, and I'm sure the one most think back to when playing this game uh, Lois's time at the cannery. I think this, not, it's not my favourite one. I still love Molly's introduction. I, 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 I just gelled with Molly immediately. Lovely little girl. Uh, to all those who say storytelling has no place in video games, this is where I'll be pointing them. We've, we've said that already, what um, Julius said. But he says it's because of this introspective and this virtual space. Um, he can say, I, I can't tell you what it's like to go crazy or to become if so immersed in my own fantasies to distract me from the pains of life that it takes over my peripheral vision to the point that I stay past the end of the day. But I can experience to a very limited extent what it must be like for someone else doing that by playing through this level, monotonously dragging a fish. And we've gone through what else he said about, you know, filling in the, the rest of his um, fantasy life before finishing his life unfortunately so what did nick say about that greg um so nick kind of agreed mostly and he said the highlight is definitely the fish bit the bathtub the swing the monster under the bed were all great everything else was forgettable 
Ooh, Nick is drifting away from it. <laughs> uh, so we, we end up basically pushing towards the last chapter, and it, it ends, um, it, it blends two things together, but uh, the third as well, which is Edie, the grandmother. This is now, there's very few finches left. The mother wants to drag Edith away from the house because of some curse that the finches have because they're all perishing at a young age. Edith, the grandmother, Edie, sorry, 1917 to 2010, so she didn't perish young. And she seemed like any other grandmother, a very strong-willed woman who was like, you know, um, you got there was an evacuation one year and it's like, you got to leave here. I'm not leaving my house. Um, it reminded me of one of my grandmothers, actually. Um, very strong-willed and very, you know, feminist and pushing. She liked Edith a lot and wanted Edith to find... Not the truth of things, but wanted to find Edith a truth by telling these stories, which her mother was dead set against. Edith's mother was dead set against. So Jonah said, I still wonder what Grandma, Grandma Edie saw when the sea was down. So you start Edie. Uh, the sea has, there's been an earthquake. The water has gone out of, of the sea. She walks to Odin's old sunken house. It's the first time she can get there. She gets lost in fog. She th sees things in the fog. Then she arrives at the, the house. She opens the gate and we don't know what she saw because Edith's mother interrupts Edith reading the book and the book gets torn in half. Um, it's Well, we will talk about that part first. So what did you make of that? Did that actually happen? Because Edie survived after that, you know? That's not Edie's demise. I wasn't really sure what to make of, of this chapter, really. Um, it may have been, like, towards the end of the game, but it didn't... It wasn't really a memorable end to it, because, like, <laughs> as we just entered, like, talking about it there, like, I was thinking, like, oh, what actually happened here? Because I don't remember. And then, obviously, you're telling me about going through the fog and stuff, and yet I remember that happened. Um... Yeah, I, don't, I honestly don't know what to make of, of that one. Is it is it trying to say something about dreams and maybe the grandmother is trying to put some, some shine and some zest into what's happened to her family by making stories up and the vast majority of what Edith Finch is going through and uh, unve unveiling as she goes through these stories actually quite possibly didn't happen and they're quite um literally elab elaborations of of the grandmother quite possibly that's I another mean, interpretation you know i mean putting locks on all the the doors in the yeah. houses is pretty <laughs> that's the, the mother did that the locks and then yeah. the grandmother drilled holes and put the peepholes in yeah. <laughs> i mean it's, it's all the very mother's strange, trying to <laughs> lock away the past but the grandmother wants to Wants to be seen. Yeah, wants it to be seen. Anyway, as we carry on through that chapter, um, Edith and her mother drive away from the grandmother, and that's the last time that um, Edith Finch sees her grandmother alive. So her grandmother did survive this dreamlike sequence going down towards Odin's house in, on the, on the, as the tide had gone out very far. And then we find out that Edith's mother gets probably cancer or like I alluded to, possibly some disease that um, is genetic that Molly also had. Um, she has the same kind of spots on her hand, like uh, liver spots in a way, and liver problems, who knows. The mother passes away. So this is when Edith, uh, obviously after this event, then has come back to relive these memories to see what has happened to her, uh, to her family. It then goes into more of a dreamlike sequence where you're surrounded with letters and the beating of a heart mm -hmm. and it's very evident from the way you move forward that mm -hmm. you are going through the sequence of childbirth from mm -hmm. the perspective of a child <laughs> yep. and as Edith is narrating this sequence we find out that she probably didn't survive through the mm -hmm. childbirth and the child is now motherless we don't know anything of the father and you do see a grave at the end of it from 1999 to 2017. So Edith was 17, 18 years old. And the child is there. And the child looked about five, six, six years old maybe, maybe a bit older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
maybe trying to piece may, maybe the stories from this child's perspective who knows um, but it's about the continuation of life and it doesn't matter what went before we will start new beginnings and you've got your own life to look forward to don't let mine drag you down <laughs> Did you enjoy the ending of that part? Not not the ED part, but the the, the birth and um, Edith's demise. Well, ultimately, I think you knew going into the game that ultimately Edith was gonna fall victim to what would be perceived, I suppose, as like the curse of the family or whatever, uh, and that she would ultimately die as well. Um, the thought of dying during childbirth is like. <laughs> scary thought and like it's something I've thought of as well like with, <laughs> with my own wife has, has been given birth both times and like we're pregnant again and like I find find the general pregnancy uh, thing scary at, at the best time because you in my head like, I always feel like something bad is going to happen at some point like every scan you go to so like yeah like I'd, like I'd be petrified if something happened to, to my wife when she was given birth so like hearing it uh, at the end of this game was kind of a wee bit sad in a way I kind of like the way like visually you could tell obviously like you were like like the birth was happening without it being too like gruesome or graphic yeah, in any graphic, sort of way yeah, like it yeah, was yeah. but it was like you could tell what was happening and that was done like um, the Walter thing. That was done like a light at the end of the tunnel as well. You know, it was it was done like that kind of heavenly passage. Yeah, um, but I suppose you're kind of left wondering, like, uh, for for the young boy, like, uh, will he too uh, fall victim to some sort of tragedy in some way? Who knows? Yeah, we Edith Finch. To what what remains of Edith Finch's baby? The sequel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the credits happen, which was quite. I really found the credits quite touching. Actually, it, it, we allude, kind of alluded it to it before on the credits roll, and it is the pictures of the development team's families and and of the development team as they were young as well. So they've obviously taken a lot of their stories and turned them into what Edith Finch would uh, end up with. You know, deaths in families. You know, a disease, a cancer in families stern grandmothers you know I, I i see a lot we all we all do see a lot of what was in edith's family in our own families and our own life experiences so summing up the game just to finish this podcast this uh, podcast episode which has gone on a little bit longer than we anticipated <laughs> greg <laughs> um how would you sum up edith finch as a as an experience well i want to touch on what Jonas is saying there saying it's surprising yeah. how much I still remember honestly it's an impactful game and I would probably agree with that obviously I haven't only played it recently there it's obviously I'm going to probably remember what happened in it but it, there is a lot to like lots of different interpretations and stuff to what actually happened in the story and it does actually get you to think about things uh, personally as someone who isn't generally into story driven games or like these walking simulators as they're called it's probably one of the better ones I've played um, whether that makes it a good game as such or not I, I, I don't know this is blurring the lines of game and experience you know but uh, for, for me as you said like a walking simulator this is by far the best walking simulator I've ever played and it I don't see why game why games we we won't use the word game, but I don't see why you certain things of this nature can't do what Edith Finch does. I, can you classify it as a game? There are mini game elements to it as you're working your way through the story, but it is a story, and I, I've tried to persuade. I, I tried again this morning to persuade my wife. Like it's two hours long. Just you watch a movie for two hours. Go and play Edith Finch play for two hours. And she's nearly, she's ne she nearly did it today. <laughs> so I'll, I'll keep on her and, and have her experience it, and I'll, I'll, I'll feed back her interpretations of it in the future as well. But even if you don't classify it as a game, I think it's still worth an experience that uh, needs to be seen. It's, it's definitely worth, worth seeing, um, and that, the word worth, <laughs> is, <laughs> can be taken in Norway because I think the. The normal price of the game is seventeen ninety nine. Yeah, and I would actually say, 
definitely, definitely not <laughs> at that price. Because like we say, it's, it's pretty much a two hour experience. I got it for around about five pound and that felt felt pretty much just about right. I think it was uh, Nick here said that I think anyone who paid £8.99 for it has been robbed. <laughs> Nick has gone um, down the other thing. He said, let alone full price, which was £17.99. I did pay 8 99 I don't feel robbed. I've played through it twice. I, like I said, I probably will play through it again in a few years' time to see, what, see it from a different perspective once again. As a game, it's average. But it has some nice ideas. As a film, it's not bad. Certainly not deserving of all the awards it got. Mm-hmm. And 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 this 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 I, I I can't put words to this. I find it very difficult to explain that. It's it is a game, like Nick said. It's it, if it's it would be better as a film. I'm on about why why can't games be films? Why can't games be this interactive walk through someone else's world? Yeah, like. It, uh people probably get like they focus too much on like distinctions at times that's a problem just in society in general i suppose but like there is definitely no problem in like interactive uh, opportunities like this here where it's it's not it's not really a game in like the the traditional sense of the word but also if it was a film you might lose some of the what makes this interesting as well so there's no harm in being in this sort of middle ground i sort of find like um it's a game that i find very difficult to sort of like process in terms of like how we'd sort of like traditionally evaluate games like because like most times you play a game and you sort of have like almost a value in your head it's like oh that's that's a six out of ten for me or seven out of ten. First time when i finished this here okay i have moments which i liked moments which maybe didn't really do it for me and like i sort of came away thinking i don't know how i would actually like score this in my head like i I wasn't able to sort of like decipher what my feelings were about the game and then like i played through it again this week just sort of in preparation for our discussion again today and i kind of expected to get a wee bit more clarity on what i felt about it and again <laughs> i'm struggling to to place it like i i don't know if i think it's oh this is this is really good or if i think it's oh, it's, it's not that great but there are a few shining moments like like nick sort of alludes to i think i'm probably somewhere in the in the middle but this definitely the second time i played it like obviously it loses some of that impact because you know what what's going to happen and you've made all the wee sort of discoveries and things now you will pick up all the wee bits of the story as like if you explore a wee bit more or whatever and you'll you'll notice things that in the second playthrough that become more clear to you because of what you know what the story is from the first time you play through it so you'll notice those wee things like like obviously all the cans of tuna and stuff that are sitting in the kitchen and, and whatnot and whatever else is sitting about but yeah it's it's a tough game for me to evaluate and I think if it goes on sale again, eight ninety nine again that's the sale price at the moment. I think that probably is pushing it. That would be definitely towards the upper limits of what I'd be be prepared to like recommend paying for this here. But if you see it again on sale cheaper than that, I think it's definitely worth giving it a go to see what what sort of experience you have yourself and what sort of connotations you have yourself from each chapter. But is it a great game? Mm, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say great. Not an eight is great. Uh, Nick <laughs> has given it a seven out of ten here, even though he's been. Um, he says uh, a, a nice idea overall, but too short. He wanted more, and even though he's been negative on some of it, and uh, he said the story dragged on a bit. He said the game overall was too short, and a 7 out of 10. He said it would have been a 6 if it were not for a couple of interesting stories that played with some uh, mechanics, like we said, with uh, the cannery and all those. Yeah, I, d- I don't feel like it needed to be longer. No, I don't. Um, if they were going to like change it in a certain way, I think maybe if you had actually like a few less characters and were able to... like delve into some of the stories a wee bit more and maybe enter just different type of types of gameplay maybe in some ways that might have might also worked 
but I definitely wouldn't have wanted to play like five or six hours of of this. Like it would have been too long. Yeah, and I wouldn't have liked to play an open world version of it either and get lost. You know, I I felt that we talked about it in the beginning that 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 way it led you along the path to the story and. If you were careful enough, you wouldn't have missed any of the stories. You would have gone to each and every single one like I did the first time. I was yeah, quite meticulous. I don't think I've got anything much else to add, except I do think it's worth eight ninety nine. Seventy ninety nine is is a hell of a push, that's for sure. But I do think it's worth eight ninety nine just for the experience of it, and I do rank it as the best walking simulator I've ever played, and. I still rank it as a game as well, but a game which I, th- I think it was. I think it was Mark. It wasn't Mark Mode. Mark Mode highlighted this when he says films, movies are machines for empathy. They're created to make you feel something, and mm-hmm. Edith Finch made me feel something um, quite often, and in a good way. Uh, every, every time, whether it was sadness, uh, bring a little tear to my eye or whether it was a chuckle at um, the lightness and making light of a, of a bleak situation. Um, Edith Finch did it with aplomb, I think. Yeah, it certainly makes you think at times. Any last words before we lay the Finches to rest? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think we've pretty much covered everything that we really needed to talk about. And like I say, if, if you get a chance to play it, I think it's worth worth trying out. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a like if you've enjoyed our content. You can also check out our other great content on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the Any Cafe podcast from all good podcast providers. Just follow the links in the description below.